Hi, American Lit. I hope you all are doing well. Today we are going to be taking a brief look at Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, um, which is a little bit different from um, The Men in the Storm and To Build a Fire, the two texts we looked at previous to this, in that it's rooted more in journalism. Um, and we'll see that in the background um, to the author here, Upton Sinclair. Um, but it's rooted in journalism, and there is, in this time period, a big focus on sort of critiquing in journalism some of some of the problems that these socialists, uh, well, socialist journalists in this case, but just journalists in general, are seeing with the society around them. So let, let's get a little bit of background into Sinclair here. Upton Sinclair, so sort of writing mainly around the early 20th century here, was sent by the socialist newspaper Appeal to Reason to Chicago to investigate working conditions in the stockyards where animals were processed into meat. So you can think of it as a slaughter yard if, if that helps you to understand that. Sinclair himself was a socialist and they explained what that means which meant that he believed that the means and products of production should be collectively owned by the workers. So the workers should own the factories, um, you know, in, and things like meat plaque packing plants and stockyards where they, they produce meat. He believed that socialism with its focus on strong government regulation and collective action could solve many of the inequalities of his era. So you guys remember from our introduction to this unit, there were, you know, it was a great time for industry, right? And you had Rockefeller, Vanderbilt um, doing very well in this time period, but they were um, of a very few, a very privileged few that actually made most of that wealth. Um, regular workers didn't benefit so much. So that was really unequal. The result of Sinclair's investigation in Chicago was his most famous novel, The Jungle, which he was faced to self-publish after several publishers turned down the manuscript and uh, something to think about why publishers would would turn that down that actually is an important question to ponder as you as we read this excerpt Jurgis Rudkus is how you pronounce that the main character is a Lithuanian immigrant who works in the stockyards right? as we heard there were there was a big uptick in immigration around this period and those recent more recent immigrants tended to congregate in the cities and find um, that more menial labor. There is a paired text with this by Eric Schlosser. We are not going to be reading that text. We're gonna be focusing on the, the more period text here, which is the jungle. So let's get into it. We're going to be focused here, um, mainly, so our, our focus for this reading is to identify uh, the word choices that the really striking word choices that Sinclair is choosing and how those word choices are contributing to both his tone. So that is sort of the attitude that the, um, the speaker or the narrator um, and ultimately the author is taking towards his subject. And from that, we can, we can really clearly determine what the purpose of this piece is. And for your um, writing for today or the assessment, I am gonna be asking you to essentially create your own um, piece that uh, uses word choice to achieve a certain purpose. And so this, this is modeling essentially for that as well. So let's get into it. This is from The Jungle, remember it's, an, it's a novel, so you're not getting the whole thing. This is an excerpt, um, but this is, this is kind of a pivotal point in that, in that novel. Yurgis heard of these things little by little, and the gossip of those who were obliged to perpetrate them. It seemed as if every time you met a person from a new department, you heard of new swindles and new crimes. There was, for instance, a Lithuanian who was a cattle butcher for the plant where Maria worked, which killed meat for canning only. And to hear this man describe the animals which came to this place would be worthwhile of a Dante or a Zola. And it is crucial here to note what the footnote is. So this is referring to Dante Alighieri, um, who wrote the Inferno, a journey through hell. So a lot of scenes from hell. Okay. And then, uh, Emile Zola, uh, who's a French playwright novelist. I'm focusing on political and social. Ills. So these, these are both, um, 
playwrights and authors who are focusing on the bad um, parts of society. And Dante's Inferno was a critique on uh, society, even though it, it dealt with spiritual matters. It seemed that they must have agencies all over the country to hunt out old and crippled and diseased cattle to be canned. There were cattle which had been fed on, quote, whiskey malt, the refuse of the breweries, and had become what the men called steerly, which means covered with boils. It was a nasty job killing these, for when you plunged your knife into them, they would burst and splash foul-smelling stuff into your face. And when a man's sleeves were smeared with blood and his hands steeped in it, how was he ever to wipe his face or to clear his eyes so that he could see? It was stuff such as this that made the embalmed beef that had killed several times as many United States soldiers as all the bullets of the Spaniards. Only the army beef, besides, was not fresh canned. It was old stuff that had been lying for years in the cellars. All right. And as we get, just to take a look back here, because there is a lot of strong word choice that's, that's really pointing us towards a certain purpose, and I'll, I'll point some of these out. So what I'm noticing here um, from Sinclair as he's constructing the scene of the, um, of the stockyards uh, are, you know, some critical words here, swindles and crimes, okay? Now, you know, these are words that have, when we talk about connotation, right, the implicit meaning often emotional behind it. Usually we think of those as positive or negative, right? So positive or negative, I, clearly negative, right? I'm thinking, well, swindles, uh, you know, and crimes, you're taking advantage of someone unfairly. You're going against what society thinks is appropriate there. And, you know, scandalous, um, I think would be a, a even more specific connotation um, that we can narrow that down to. So there's, there's something wrong here. There's, I'm, I'm sensing that there's something wrong with this scene, right? And they're talking about all these different departments of the meatpacking plant. So there's something wrong with what's going on here. And, and then we get into this description of the animals, right? And, you know, worthwhile of a Dante or a Zola. Okay, that's another, you know, that, that's definitely a conscious choice there on the part of the author, right? Not describing these in, in sort of objective terms, but one's very loaded or heavy with um, what these allusions, which are references to, to other texts, right? Um, you know, images of hell, right? And then these social ills spoken of by Zola. So, you know, those are the implicit meanings there and that those allusions, right? Again, being very negative or, or perhaps critical. And then we see these words, right? Um, describing these animals, crippled, diseased, okay? Um, uh, let's see if we've got other words here. Covered with boils, that's another one that really gives me clear imagery, right? I get, I'm getting very clear images in my mind of these disgusting cattle that they're using. And ultimately, you know, these are being ultimately to be canned, right? These are going to be given to people at some point, <laughs> um, which is terrible. And, you know, even he even digs deeper into some of these images like the boils, because when you plunge your knife into them, and this is all really clear imagery, right? It's, you know, you plunge your knife into these disgusting boils, and they splash out blood all over you. Um, these words and phrases are definitely communicating very clear and disgusting imagery. Um, and is ultimately going to contribute to um, Yurgis's purpose, which I'll which I'll note after I get through the next paragraph. But we're getting this very disgusting, um, very negative, very critical viewpoint of this space of the um, of the meat cannery and the slaughterhouse. So it's very it's very disgusting. So let's read on here. So this is from the viewpoint of Yurgis, who is an immigrant, right? Then one Sunday evening, Yurgis sat puffing his pipe by the kitchen stove and talking with an old fellow whom Jonas had introduced and who worked in the canning rooms at Durham's. And so Yurgis learned a few things about the great and only Durham canned goods. So Durham's is a, uh, is a, is a canning plant, right, um, where they can food, okay? They were regular alchemists at Durham's. They advertised a mushroom catsup for the men who made it did not know what a mushroom looked like. They advertised potted chicken, and it was like the boarding house soup of the comic papers through which a chicken had walked through with rubbers on. Perhaps they had a secret process for making chi chickens chemically. Who knows, said Yurgis's friend. 
The things that went into the mixture were tripe, which is uh, sheep intestines. Uh, I'm sorry, this will be pig intestines. And the fat of pork and beef suet and hearts of beef. And finally, the waist ends of veal. Waist ends would be the very end of the intestine, which is sort of where fecal matter and stuff comes up when they had any. They put these up in several grades and sold them at several prices, but the contents of the cans all came out of the same hopper. Okay, we talked about scandals and swindles and scandal, swindles and crimes, sorry, above, right? Um, <laughs> this would be a good candidate. And then there was potted game, potted grouse, potted ham, and deviled, right? And so it goes on like that, and I'll let you continue the description. But here, we, we, we can really get a, form, a fully formulated view of the purpose here. And there are two things that I will point out. Number one um, is who we're hearing this from, all right? Who is, our, who is our source of this information that we're learning about Durham's in particular here? And, you know, we're, we're, we know Jurgis or Jurgis. Jurgis was uh, speaking in this, this paragraph up here. And then we're introduced to this old fellow, um, who Jonas had introduced, so it seems like a personal acquaintance. And they're in the, there's this scene that they're puffing his pipe by the kitchen stove. And why why include that detail? You, you might think it's always good to think of like, well, that's that's an interesting detail. Why why would Sinclair include that? And what it achieves here is we can imagine this. If you're a reader, like you know, this is you can almost imagine yourself sitting with them, you know, in this in this relaxed. Um, you know, almost family-like setting with someone who you're trusting, right? Because there's someone who'd been introduced to you. There's a very personal connection there. And so there, there's a very believable, very believable um, tone that just comes from this description of what they're doing as they're talking. The fact that, you know, that he's smoking a pipe, right? And you might think of uh, at this time, you know, some, you know, that was a grandfatherly thing to do. So it's like a grandfather is going to tell you some things about the meatpacking industry. Um, and, and that really sort of sets up, right? And it's like, okay, I can believe these guys. Now we're going to hear all the grisly details of this Durham's place. Um, now, it's interesting because, you know, he refers to it. The narrator refers to this as, you know, some apparently good sounding descriptors, right? The great and only, it's a national institution. They're regular alchemists. And by the way, alchem alchemy is the, the medieval science, quote unquote, of changing um, base metals like steel or iron into gold, right? It, it wasn't real, although it promised quite a lot. Um, and what these are, these are, th th there's a, there's an ironic tone here. And when you have an ironic tone, right, when you're being verbally ironic, you mean the opposite of what you're saying. And so here, great and only means, you know, given especially what we, the context of what we heard before, you know, th th this is very joking, right? You know, this is, oh, they're a regular alchemists there, right? Um, because as we learn further down, right, um, you know, you have these men putting together a mushroom, mushroom catsup, and they have no idea what mushroom actually is. There's a potted chicken, um, you know, who's, you know, <laughs> you know, the, the, this disgusting image of chicken that we have, uh, you know, described here. And all, all of these things that are being passed off as one thing, but are actually another, all right, um, you know, tripe hearts of beef you know at waist ends of veal and you know and they just you know label them you know label them different grades and call them different things but they're all basically the same thing and it's all this disgusting waste parts of the the animal so the point um that i'd like to you know that we're getting to here is, is the purpose and the purpose of this sort of very negative tone of the meatpacking plant and the the ironic tone that's introduced in the second paragraph here is that he's being critical sinclair is being critical of the meatpacking industry he's trying to describe it very disgustingly very unappetizingly so that um he can effectively critique it and this goes to his purpose so my hope is that you guys can create something similar with a current event by creating your own um expose or informative piece